everybody, I'm uh, Federico Morando from the uh, Nexus Center for Internet and Society. My role is just to introduce uh, you to our guest and the professor for this lecture, Professor Jean-Claude Guedon from the University of Montreal, who is also a uh, trustee of the uh, Nexus Center for Internet and uh, Society. And we are very glad to uh, have uh, this lecture from him about uh, open access uh, because he's definitely one of the worldwide experts in uh, uh, open access. Come on, uh, you, you cannot uh, deny that, uh, <laughs> that you are. And so uh, I let uh, the floor to uh, thank, you. thank you very much. You're welcome. Do um, you hear me correctly? Is that okay? The volume? Anyone doesn't hear? Okay. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much, Federico. And uh, welcome to Open Access. I'm going to try and cover in about an hour uh, a lot of ground. Uh, this may go too fast at some points, and uh, for that reason, uh, I will ask you to interrupt me if you don't understand or something is not clear. Don't hesitate to pipe in, to raise your hand, and say, "Look, I, I just don't get it." Uh, it's no problem to, to really cover the things well. So the, uh, the whole uh, story is going to be organized essentially in this fashion. I'll do a bit of history to begin. Then I would like to analyze, if possible, the main stakes of the, of the whole open access uh, movement. Then I will go through an examination of what I call here funder support, that is those that finance the research. Uh, I will go through a very essential part which will take us a, a good deal of time, which will be the, the publisher's reaction to rather the publisher's role into this whole thing. This will lead me to define what I might call front lines in a, an ongoing battle. And because this battle is on, ongoing, and because it's, a, it's not a, an easy, uh, it's not an easy thing to do to predict who is going to win the battle. Um, I'm asking at the end of the future. Just to put a little bit of background on that last question, you have to think about the book itself, the printed book, and perhaps in a way a bit different from what you are used to thinking. The book, as a printed object, is so familiar to us that we think that nothing else could have ever emerged and could have been the, part, the, the form that the book could have taken uh, universally uh, after the invention of the printing press by Gutenberg in the 15th century. Actually, the story is far more complicated than that. In the very form of the book, the fact that, for example, titles appear, the fact that authors appear, authors' names, printers' names appear, publishers' names appear, cities of publication appear, and the rest of it, all these were the result of negotiations, not on a, around the table, but historically speaking, of negotiations between groups that wanted very different things from the book. And finally, some sort of equilibrium managed to emerge in the 17th and early 18th centuries. And then after that, the book became not fixed, but much more stable, so much so that by now we have a feeling that the book had to be the way it is. But there was no such necessity in the history of the book as it grew up in time. Well, we are at a time in the digital context, now that we are going through a transition which is at least as massive, as deep and as important as the, the printing press was in the 15th century, we are in the midst of the defining, the definition of the kinds of objects, tools, processes, relationships that this digital context is going to build. And what I'm going to talk to you about today is about scientific communication. It's one relatively small facet of a massive change which is of course affecting practically, practically every aspect of our lives today, but we still don't know exactly how it's going to turn out, but we know enough already that there are a lot of positive things and also quite a lot of negative things. So we, we have to, to play with this, but it's a good thing to remember that this is not new in the digital context 
every important technological invention in the area of communication has always brought about a long series of battles which just because you are young and uh, you think that everything probably began when you were about 10 years old, um, that is about 8 years ago or something like that, or 10 years ago for some of you. Uh, no, it's going, these kinds of things go on generally for generations and you're going to see a lot of it evolve during your own, your own lifetime. Uh, a privilege I envy you for because probably I won't see a lot of the things that will be very important in the next, let's say, 40 or 50 years. So these are, this is the backdrop I would like to draw today for this sort of thing. So let's go a little bit of history and I would like to very quickly remind you that scientific, scientific research, the way it works, is really like a huge you know, staccato type um, conversation taking place among people spread out all over the place in the world. Essentially what's happening is that someone does some research on the question that has emerged somehow and they manage to get the funding to do that kind of research or the support or the tools or a combination of all that and then they, they finally produce some results which they publish, in other words, they put at the disposal of others so that others can check it, perhaps confirm it, perhaps complete it, perhaps improve it, perhaps just say it's a piece of crap. Uh, it's really a discussion where everything is exposed to the criticism of others. <coughs> now, of course, in, in, in practice, in most of the time, the work is being done like, as if everything was adding up on top of everything else. But don't ever forget that science fundamentally works on the principle of mutual criticism. The whole notion of peer review, the whole notion of publishing after someone and redoing the experiments, extending them at the same time, modifying the results already acquired are good examples of that. And when you do that kind of work at a very fundamental uh, level, as Newton did at the end of the 17th century, and Einstein did at the beginning of the 20th century, you end up with a complete scientific revolution. This led to the creation of communication channels and communication tools, which at first were the, were the post office and mail. People were writing to each other. Galileo wrote to Kepler, and Kepler wrote to Galileo. And it took months, of course, because all that was carried by horses. So you can see how the this thing is happening. But journals appeared at the end of the, of the 17th century, 1665 to be precise, and from that point on you have something that develops around journals, scientific journals. And in the 19th century, as the number of scientists began to grow much more, and the academies that were at the center of scientific activities in the 18th centuries began to be insufficient to cover the level of activity and the, uh, the intensity of the research that began to develop probably in the wake also of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, that led to the creation of scientific associations. And these scientific associations began to produce journals because people were isolated in their little provinces and they wanted to get their work out to other people. So they would, they would pay some dues to the association to support the, the creation of a journal. The journal meant 500 or 1,000 copies of that journal. And with that journal, they had the uh, habit of exchanging them with journals from other associations so that by the dues of a few dozens of scientists and the creation of one journal, you could produce, you could create a library of uh, documentation uh, of several other journals, which of course was extraordinarily efficient and also very cheap. The, uh, the, the situation really lasted for quite a long time until uh, commercial publishers began to get into the, the, the fray, so to speak, and at first they were doing it more as a marginal sort of activity, I won't go into the reasons why they did so, but after the Second World War they became actually, they got into it in a real big way. And this was particularly due to the fact that after the Second World War, the amount of scientific research suddenly increased an awful lot, partially because of the Cold War in particular. So you have a number of new commercial publishers who start taking a part in the publishing of journals, 
And they start doing it no longer for prestige reasons, as they used to, but now really in earnest to start making money. And one particular person I have put on, the, on this slide, Robert Maxwell, is quite famous because he managed to create a whole series of journals called the uh, International Journal of Something, each one of them was called by that way. And they, he managed to create several hundreds of these journals, and he managed to make them uh, look, not only look, but be uh, authoritative, prestigious, visible, and therefore very, very, very important in the communication patterns of, 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 of science of the period. And that, path, that tendency was strongly reinforced by the creation in the 60s, 1960s, of a tool that you probably use still. It's called the Web of Science nowadays. So many of you, I suppose, have used the Web of Science in your research. Uh, but the, um, at that time, it was called the Science Citation Index. And what you have to remember is that the Science Citation Index was made possible and created by an argument uh, crafted by Eugene Garfield, the creator of the Science Citation Index, which essentially said, I cannot cover all the journals with all the articles and all the citations in all these journals, but if I take the right kind of journals, if I take the right subset of these journals, I'm going to cover what he calls core science. He invents essentially a concept of core science, and he says by just looking at these journals, I have the essential information I need to understand where science is going and what important science is, uh, where uh, important science is happening. So in this regard, he, he, he constructed this idea of a core science, but at the same time, without realizing it, he made, yeah, as this thing was very visible to the librarians, and they all began to buy this very same list of journals, the first list was only a thousand titles, um, they, they, he created what economists call an inelastic market. That is to say, a market whose distribution will not be terribly affected, however much more expensive it becomes. So then the publishers began to realize that, Maxwell in particular, and they were all the more eager to enter in the publishing world of science that suddenly this formerly prestigious attitude for their general collection of, of publications began to become a cash cow uh, for, the, for, for their business. They could make a lot of money with that. Nowadays, some of the big publishers like Elsevier, for example, uh, get out of their publications of journals a profit rate before taxes of close to 40%, which is quite enormous. There are relatively few kinds of businesses that can claim that level of profit. This is what emerged after the Second World War. And that led to the last, the last bullet in, my, in this slide, a serial price of prices. The price of journals began to increase very rapidly, and libraries began to, to yell and scream because their budgets could not follow. And out of that, all sorts of very, very negative consequences ensued, uh, including a, a sort of fascination and hyp hypnosis, you might say, around the important journals that everybody had to have, whatever the price. And all this was uh, compounded by the fact that people began to uh, organize the competition between journals by using what they were calling the impact factor, which is a, a, a kind of measurement of the citations received by a particular journal over the next two years after the publication and the average number of citations per article. And, and uh, this, this impact factor, which was originally meant to help uh, manage the competition among commercial journals, ended up being used as well and extended on duty, wrongly, stupidly, to individuals who began to be evaluated by not what they publish, but by where they publish. So if you publish in Nature, even a stupid article, you were considered to be a near genius because you were just in Nature. You know? And uh, one interesting side uh, remarks I can make is that a study has been done recently between looking at the relationship between impact factors 
and, and retractions of articles when they are wrong or they have been cheated or something like that. And what you find is what you could expect. The higher the impact factor, the higher the retraction rate, which is an interesting way of, of characterizing quality or even excellence, as they say, uh, in such journals. So this is the situation that developed after the Second World War. Now, the, the uh, open access movement itself is, and you have to think of it really like that, in fact, this whole presentation should be couched in this thing. It's a consequence, it's a spin-off from the coming into the digital context. Without, without the uh, digital context, you could not have open access. Imagine trying to diffuse printed journals freely, gratis. You couldn't do it because the, uh, the cost of selling the journal, the cost of printing the journals, print, printing an extra copy would be too expensive. But with the digital uh, world that we invented, with the internet and, and the digital documents, the marginal cost of copying the document is almost zero. And the marginal cost of transmitting that document to practically any place on the planet is also extremely close to zero. So that means that open access you might say economically became possible. So what, what, how did that happen? Well, first of all, there were early experiments, which were actually experiments in electronic publishing, digital publishing. I myself started a journal uh, in the humanities in 1991, at the time when even the internet was barely known. And, uh, and uh, many people, many people, a few, few people were doing the similar thing, some of them as early as 1989. So obviously, uh, the whole thing started first by a series of experiments in electronic publishing. And as they were experiments, the, the general attitude was, let's not put a price barrier behind that, behind the, in front of that. Let's see first how people react to the very notion, the very idea of having to play and deal with uh, an open access and a journal, which de facto was an open access. Something like a movement began related to the, uh, the crisis in the prices of journals, and I'm um, giving here a number of things that happened. Because of the prices of journals, in 2001, so 14 years ago, a, a petition was launched worldwide against German companies such as Elsevier, Springer, Wiley, and the rest of them, uh, because they were practicing, uh, they were using a pricing system which was completely, completely uh, crazy. So that created a, a, a petition of about 30,000 people signing in the biomedical sciences, because this was coming out of biomedicine, and 30,000 people around the world, researchers, signed that petition. But it was a foolish petition, it was a nice petition, it was a lovely idea, but a bit naive and foolish, because what it said is, uh, I, as a researcher, will no longer uh, referee articles from these companies, and I will not submit articles to journals of this company, and uh, the hell with them, etc. You know? And uh, of course, this is fine if you're like me, you're you know, tenured, I'm at the end of my career and all that, if I refuse to work without severe, it's not going to affect my career very much. But at your age, uh, that's not the thing to do. Because at the very first, uh, first threshold that you have to go through in your, in your career, you would be faced with very, very difficult choices, which could affect your whole life. And personally, I would say, don't get involved with that kind of, of issues uh, at, uh, at early stages of your career. So the Public Library of Science in 2001 failed. But at the same time, it was like a big wake-up call saying, yeah, there is really something wrong. And it was this time not librarians who were, uh, who were uh, screaming about the prices. It was researchers. So that was important. That was really important. Then, in the wake of this, and because of the, uh, of the petition that was failing, the Open Society Institute, which is a foundation financed by the billionaire Soros, George Soros, uh, met, convened a number of us, I was, I was privileged to be in that meeting in 2001, December, 
And then we, this gave rise because at the end of the day we had not achieved all that much. But at the end, at the end of the day we decided that we would continue the debate by crafting a document. And the document finally appeared in February of 2002. And it is the famous BOAI, the Budapest Open Access Initiative, which you can read online very, very easily. Uh, just do BOAI in uh, Google, for example, and you'll find it right away. And uh, it's available in quite a few languages, including Italian, I believe. And uh, it does a number of things. It defines open access. And it also uh, outlines two, two ways to get there, two ways which later on will be called the green way and the gold way. The green way is for each one of us as researchers, we simply deposit some version of our articles in some, de some repository, either a private website or an institutional repository or a thematic uh, repository to make that article available to the whole world. That was the green way. The gold way was to take journals and transform them into open access journals and move into uh, those journals uh, or to create new journals that would be open access journals. Now, the, in, the, in the wake of this, of course, a number of things happened. It was reinforced by other meetings the following year. Berlin is famous because it continues to have yearly, yearly meetings called Berlin 1, 2, 3, etc. even though it's no longer often in Berlin. And uh, then there was the Bethesda meeting, uh, not very far away in time from Berlin, the same year. And that is a particularly important meeting because at that meeting, you had the head of the Welcome Charity in the UK. You had the people from the Max Planck Institute. You had people from the NIH in the United States, National Institutes of Health, and other people of that caliber. And these were the founders. And suddenly, the founders were starting to grapple with the idea that, after all, that's not a bad idea, bad idea to, to uh, promote open access. We finance all that research, and it might be a good idea to have the rest of the world know what is the impact and the result of all, all that money that we give away, either as governments or as private charities. So at the, at the, with that began to be discussed something that was extremely important for the development of open access, the how do you fill up, how do you convince the researchers to deposit the articles. And it turned out that most researchers really could care less. Most researchers unhappily are so close to their problem and are trying just to survive in their career that they don't think about anything more than filling up their curriculum day. And when you leave researchers deposit by themselves their papers, they deposit generally no more than, no more than 10 or 20 percent of the papers get deposited, which uh, in the end is not, uh, not very satisfactory if you're thinking about creating an alternative system to uh, the present system of journals. So the issue of mandates began to emerge, mandates being uh, we force you, we want you to uh, to deposit. Sometimes these mandates have been actually self-inflicted by faculty members or researchers saying always oh, good in itself, we're going to decide collectively that we should deposit. The first example of that was the Faculty of Arts and Science at Harvard University. And the, uh, the other form of mandate was either a founder is saying if you get money from us, you will have to deposit your articles in open access in some manner, and there are all sorts of course of variations in that. And the third mode is an institution, a university for example, can decide that its researchers will, will uh, deposit uh, their research in the university uh, depository. And to make that last one very effective, the University of, uh, of uh, Liège, for example, in, in Belgium, has simply decided that when people come for evaluation within the university for promotion, the university pays attention 
only to what is inside the depository. So you can well imagine that people are very intent on putting a maximum amount of stuff in that depository just to you know, swell their, their visibility and their credibility in the same way that the old CV used to do. At the same time, around 2001, actually before the Budapest meeting and continuing afterwards, the first open access journals began to appear. Actually, the first collection of open access journals was created in early 2001. It was the Biomed Central. I'll come back on that. But uh, it's, a, it's uh, an interesting example because they also came up and invented this, uh, this business plan which turns the thing over. Instead of having the journal paid by those who are going to read for their proxy, which is called the library, in other words, the library buys uh, stuff and you have, you have open access to that stuff because the library gives, it, uh, gives you access to it freely. Uh, the idea was, why don't we put a, a cost on publishing an article in the hands of either the authors themselves or some institution that would pay in their, in their, in their stead in order to, in order to make the, the, the system work financially. The, uh, this uh, last business plan which began to be experimented in 2001 by Biomed Central uh, is still called an article processing charge and it is at the center, you'll see the, the, the bit later on, it is at the center of the, uh, of the debates right now in, uh, in the open access movement and around the open access movement. So, why do we want open access? Why do we, well, by, with all I've said already, I think the answers become quite, quite obvious. You want full access to the full literature. Would it not be nice if somehow going to your computer, you could at one spot find the literature of the world? Would it, would, would that be wonderful and great? Especially if on top of that, that literature were organized in such a way that you could navigate it efficiently so that you could avoid the not so interesting and go to the more interesting in some fashion. Would that not be absolutely great if everybody could do that? So that's, that's uh, an important thing. Why is it important? Well, for example, it avoids your doing research that has already been done, but you don't know about because simply you don't have access to the right literature. So no duplication of research with the cost associated with that. You have a better efficiency of research. You get more information more quickly and hopefully better organized. And it creates, in the end, a kind of a, a better, juster, fairer uh, playing field for all participants. If you come from a poor country or a poor institution, etc., at least you will have the same access to the literature as the ones play, working in the most, the richest institutions in the richest countries. You will give a, an even chance at the level of acquisition of knowledge. To, uh, to access this. And it, uh, it, of course, because it's in open access, it would also make all that literature far more usable to teaching all over the place, including in some disciplines and some, in some areas, in, including the teaching at the primary and secondary level. In areas like the humanities or social sciences, a lot of the articles published by researchers could be taken over and used very, very well by, by teachers in high schools or in, uh, even primary schools in some cases. It would even open the literature to everybody. Now let's take an example in mathematics. There are a lot of people who are very good at mathematics who never had a chance to really go very, very far in mathematics but are really gifted for mathematics. This is wasted brain power. And some of these people, you may never know, might be quite able to navigate through a certain line of reasoning in mathematics and make very interesting contributions in that fashion. Of course, with the usual proviso that their work will be evaluated, criticized, etc. as everybody else. And you can, if you think a bit more about it, you can quickly invent a number of other reasons why open access is really a win-win situation for practically everybody except one group, 
one potential group, the publishers, because they have to invent a business plan to deal with that. So, in terms of the funders, which can be either government agencies, either internationally, like the European Commission, or nationally, like I assume uh, national research uh, councils and, and similar things, or centers in, in, in Italy, and also private institutions that support uh, research. Uh, the funders were very quick to uh, seize themselves on the issue of open access. As I said, the Bethesda meeting in 2003 signaled the first direct implication of uh, the uh, uh, of, of the, the, welcome, of the uh, funders. I remember Mark Borkort at that meeting, in fact, saying things which were so present when he said, not only should we support open access, but we as funders, when people submit their publications, we should demand that they submit their publication in such a way that it would not be immediately obvious where the journal was, when the journal was really published so that we would be, to some extent, drawn to reading these journals and their quality in themselves and not relying on the reputation of the journal to evaluate the quality of the work. So, I mean, you see, as early as 2003, that kind of reasoning was already emerging. Founders, I mean, you have something like Welcome, the Welcome Charity in the UK, which is both versus about a million pounds a year in research money. That's a lot of money. When you have the NIH, the National Institutes of Health in the United States, paying about $18 billion to support research in the medical fields. Uh, you're talking significant money, it seems to me. And this, is not, this is not peanuts. And these people have to defend these budgets uh, to different, different uh, onlookers and overlookers. In the case of the NIH, it's directly the Congress of the United States. So they have to talk to politicians and tell them, you know, these 18 billion dollars are really worth half. And many politicians don't understand a thing about science. In fact, some of them are against science, which is even crazier. But um, you have, with open access, the possibility of telling these people, look, uh, for example, in the United States, patients who are suddenly aware that they have a very sort of life-threatening disease have testified to us the importance of being able to access the literature to educate themselves about the disease and dialogue more profitably and more deeply with a doctor in order to get a better form of treatment, in order to be able to, to negotiate essentially the, the form of treatment they want to have because of their of, that disease. Now, this kind of argument has been used in the United States and elsewhere, and has been very important politically. So, open access for the funders is a way to maximize uh, the message they want to, uh, to, to carry over, which is, we have an impact, a good impact, on the whole of society, not just researchers. Uh, and, of course, the founders want the general public also to know about research, not because they're sick and they want to know what's in the research, but to let the people know that all this money, $18 billion for the biomedical research in the U.S., for example, is not wasted money. It is really important money for the welfare, the good health of at least significant numbers of people in the population. And finally, uh, and that may be the downside of this whole thing, because founders see in open access something really positive. Unhappily, they've been a little bit too prone to accepting about any solution that would help what they thought was open access, including, uh, for example, uh, the mandates, that's fine, but they're also finding extra money to support the authors to publish in, uh, in, in journals with article processing charges, although at the same time these uh, authors could have deposited their articles in a depository and do it essentially for free without having to worry about paying processing charges to a journal unless they want to go to a journal that offers you only the article processing charge in order to publish in it. 
but generally you have alternatives. The publishers were the ones who were really, in a sense, in a, in a quandary, uh, and they wondered what to do. And they were themselves grappling with the whole issue of how to adapt to the digital world. And I must say, they were quite quick at first to adapt rather well. Back in 1991, 1991, Elsevier was running a, an experiment which was stupid in many ways, but very clever in one at least. This, the experiment was called Tulip. Well, a Dutch company, of course, will use Tulip as a, as a logo. What was Tulip about? Well, it was about putting some journals on big video discs and then selling the video discs on campuses. And the bandwidth, the bandwidth needed to read these video discs was such that only an Ethernet connection at the time would have been uh, capable of allowing for a, an efficient reading of these journals. So they thought they had a recipe which could allow them to continue selling objects and limiting the use of these objects to a campus, the, essentially the Ethernet network of the university campus. But inside that tooling, there was the letter L, which hit something which was far more ominous and developed to become the dominant form of the commerce of scientific communication nowadays. And that was, that was the L of licensing. In effect, what the publishers were beginning to tell the libraries, we're not going to sell you journals anymore. We're going to negotiate with you uh, licensing of access at certain conditions, but you won't own that. All you own is for a limited time every year, uh, access to a certain number of journals, and if you don't pay up every year, well, you lose the access, and you will have nothing. You'll have nothing in your library uh, corresponding to what you've paid for before. That that last part was quickly co uh, corrected. The libraries insisted on having copies of uh, all, their, all the journals that they had paid for. But you see that the whole thing now is a license, an access license, and not a contract of sale. This is really important because a contract can be crafted in any which way. It's between any one of you and me, for example, and we can put any condition on the, on the contract. And you don't have to worry about copyright. Copyright is only useful at that point because the company owns the, compu the copyright of the article and because of that they can license the use of that article any which way they want. So you see how the, the, the situation is quietly but radically changing in the mid-90s uh, in the world of scientific communication. So what did they do those uh, as publishers, well, you see the statements here. They first began by not acknowledging the open access movement. Uh, you know, I, I heard statements like saying, these are communists, uh, these are uh, anarchists, these are anti-capitalists. I've heard that from Durkheim, who is the present uh, CEO of Springer, for example. He used to say, well, those who are for open access are just against capitalism. So that sort of thing. completely crazy stuff, stupid but uh, indicative of a knee-jerk reaction to a situation that initially scared them. And traditionally, when you're scared by something, the first reaction is to say, it doesn't exist. Second thing is, okay, I realize it exists. It's not important. I laugh about it. And that was for a long time. We made fun of open access uh, advocates saying this is impossible, it can't work, it's crazy, you're stupid, and so on and so forth. I remember Peter Bowman, who worked for Elsevier, explaining that perhaps, perhaps after all, uh, you could have a, a, a state which is the subscription-based um, access to journals and another state called open access. And it may well be that open access might be better than, than the, the first state. But the, the energy barrier, as he called it, borrowing that from, obviously from chemical reactions, the energy barrier between the two is such that it would be impossible to go from A to B. So they, there was this kind of dismissive attitude to open access saying it just cannot work. Then it began to fight back, and that's, uh, that's where the, the, uh, 
the anti-capitalism communism and the rest of, of it uh, began to really emerge in a big way. And I've not heard what they said among themselves when they were just among themselves, but I suspect it was pretty bad. Um, and then, suddenly, they began to experiment in earnest. Some of them began to understand that after all, uh, if you think of the article processing charge, there may well be a way there to make quite a bit of money, as much if not more than with the subscription system, all the more so that if you make the two work at the same time, you may be able to just add the second revenue stream to the first one and become really nicely rich. You know? And that's when really, the, I would say, the battle that's still with us began in earnest. I would put that in 2005 when Biomed Central is bought by Springer and becomes at that point uh, the experimental zone of the article page processing charge for that company and of course it is closely observed by the other companies who ultimately all move in that direction. So as I've said, the, the publishers had begun their first, uh, their first uh, uh, experimentation with digital publications back in 91-92, the two-day experiment. In the mid-90s, they invented something which was absolutely hellish, um, which was a way to tie up the libraries in knots and, and at the same time make sure, make sure that smaller publishers would gradually disappear because uh, all the money would be channeled increasingly towards the big publishers. It's the so-called big deal. Now, for those of you who don't know what the big deal is, imagine the following situation. You're a librarian. You negotiate with me and from Elsevier. You say, I want for my library 600 of your 2,000 journals, because these are the ones we really need in our, in our institution. We haggle. We come to a price. I say, for example, OK, a million bucks, and you'll have it you'll have the, the 600 journals. Then you're about to sign that and then say, oh, wait a minute. Uh, what would you say if you had the $100,000 and I give you the rest? You see? And the point there is extremely clever because, of course, it looks tremendous. I mean, even though you don't really want the other journals, uh, maybe there are some you might have wanted a bit and so on and so forth. So for 100000 good deal. You can go back to your dean or your provost and explain to him that the cost per title has really gone down drastically. Because with $100,000 more, you get three times as many articles journals. And, and, uh, and that puts you in the, in the, in the good, the good uh, side of that administrator. And, and everybody looks happy because you can turn to the faculty and the researcher and say, look what we've got, we've got the whole of us of here. You know? But that 100,000, you can no longer apply it to smaller publishers. You know? And the, so they, they are in an increasingly difficult financial <coughs> position. And the, uh, the, the, uh, of course, if you want to get out of that, you get into a terrible mess because as soon as you want to remove just one title, they insist to reapply the kind of list price of titles. And it's, it's very, very difficult. My own university is presently doing this kind of effort, and it is uh, very, very painful, and it was very, very difficult uh, to maintain calm among the faculty, because at first, most of the faculty did not know anything about any of that, and they said, we're losing our severe, and they were going panicky about it. So you have this, this sort of situation, which was developed at that period. They invented um, the APCs, as I've told you, with Biomed Central, and then when, when uh, Biomed Central went to, uh, to Springer, the same year, something new happened within Springer, which they called Open Choice, which has led to what has been, is known nowadays as hybrid journals. What is a hybrid journal? It's a regular journal with a subscription price, a paywall, a barrier around it. But if you, as an author, would like to have your article in that journal in open access, you pay a fairly considerable sum of money, several thousands of dollars uh, routinely, generally, and you, you end up having a, the, uh, your article in open access. Now the problem is that the publisher doesn't publish more articles 
because of that. And he maintains his subscri subscription prices uh, at the same time. So he gets the money from the open access journals from the authors, some authors, and he gets the full subscription price on the other side. The result is an increased revenue with no increased benefit for those who pay. That is, our taxpayers' money, or the library's budget, or the university. So these are the, the way the publishers have been adapting themselves to this digital world. And as you see, they are being increasingly clever and efficient in organizing a system that allows, allows for the control and the development of revenues. And curiously enough, here is the man that seems to have been behind all of these innovations. Jan Venterov is, a, uh, is generally credited with being one of the designers of the big deal. He was the director of Ireland Central when it was founded in 2001, and that's when the uh, article uh, processing charge appeared. And he, uh, he moved to Springer coincidentally at the moment when Open Choice appeared within the Springer journals. So you have this man um, who seems to be like a red thread uh, allowing you to follow what, how publishers have explored the possibility of adapting to, to the digital world. The most intriguing part of all this is that Jan Veltorov was also at the Budapest meeting in 2001. So he's been playing on both sides of the, of the divide, uh, playing a very ambiguous role, which I've ne I have never completely uh, understood, and I've never completely been able to analyze. Maybe one day I'll come forward uh, about what he's really doing. My hypothesis is that, one, he believes in open access, but for him, Open access is understandable only in so far as it allows publishers to really find the right kind of business plans uh, with regard to that, but at the same time keeps the publishers in the central position. He often speaks about you know, old-fashioned publishers, but actually what he wants to do is modernize publishers in the open access and digital environment with the possibility of increasing revenues. Presently, he's moving into a new area, which has to do with text and data binding, and I think he's looking for a new business model to adapt to add to, to electronic uh, and digital publishing, and it will be probably pro proposed within a framework of open access. But beware when you see things coming out of articles from Jan Veltora, who, by the way, is a very nice guy. I know him quite well. Uh, he's very bright, very sharp, very pleasant. Too. But I think he's really on the side of the publishers, not on the side of the researchers. So, what are the present front lines nowadays? Um, as I've said, if we follow Veltorov, now we see him talking about nano publishing, which is really about text and data mining, which means control over the data, and this is an increasingly tough battle uh, appearing in, uh, in various forums. Uh, right now in Europe and the rest of the world. Uh, the present front lines, hybrid journals. Publishers love hybrid journals. I mean, it's a double dipping device, sometimes triple dipping device. Triple because in some occasions, people have found that articles where authors had paid to put them in open access were also articles that you still had to pay $35 to read them if you just stumbled upon them through the search engine of a particular journal. Uh, so publishers love them. In my own hypothesis is that publishers would like open access really only in so far and mainly in so far as they are able to finally keep the hybrid journal situation completely stable and benefit from it. And this has led to the, what I call the OA fiasco in the United Kingdom where the article processing charges have been declared the important route, the main route, the, perhaps the only route in order to achieve uh, open access in Great Britain, so that the British have been able to achieve this very strange result, which is we're for open access, but it has to be uh, with 
article processing charges and it is going to uh, solve the whole problem of access at enormous cost to the British government. So this is, uh, this is of course completely untrue. The answer, the, the reason why it took, it took uh, that uh, direction is that um, having accepted the idea that open access had to be there, they went to the solution that only open access journals could be uh, acceptable, depositories were not, so that because of, it, of academic freedom you can't prevent people from publishing where they want to publish. Then they came to the conclusion, we have to support everybody to publish wherever they want to publish. The, the argument is completely fallacious because the Green Road was still available and in the case of journals that are either hybrid or are purely ABCs, open access, you still have the possibility of depositing that in the depository and in the cases which are relatively rare of journals that prevent you, forbid you from depositing your article in an open access depository you can deposit it into a closed access depository you can, ex you can publish the bibliographic data, what is called the metadata of the article publicly and if people are interested in your article and see the, the title, the summary and so on appear on <coughs> the search engine all you have to add to that is a little button called a request button and the person that wants an article clicks on that puts his or her email address that is sent automatically to the author, corresponding author, who can then, by the simple click, say yes, I, will, I want that person to have that article, and the article is automatically sent to the request person by the repository. So you don't have to limit academic freedom by not supporting article processing charges. All you have to do is create a good system of repository next to the open access journals and, and a request button for the relatively rare cases where this kind of, uh, of depositing is not legally permitted and, and could be enforced by copyright, uh, copyright things. So that's one point that should be done. What has been interesting too recently is that you sense that the publishers now think that they are in a position to counterattack and they seem to care less about the, you might say, the uh, opinion of the research communities and they are starting to change, sometimes without warning, the terms by which you were allowed to deposit uh, in uh, depositories. Very recently, for example, Elsevier really sharply restricted the, uh, the ways in which one could uh, deposit the articles with, on top of that, confusing and difficult uh, terms because there were some exceptions that were accepted, some depositories were apparently not touched and so that, and I'll come back on that, but that was, I think it's part of creating a model, a difficult uh, landscape. But you sense that the publishers right now, that's indicative of the present front lines, think they are in a position to counterattack and push back the open access movement with its requirements that I, outlined, I laid out at the beginning and, you know, and do their own kind of open access, which quite often they, they do by changing the vocabulary, for example, by replacing open access by sharing, and the sharing has conditions. So, where are the battle lines? Well, follow what's going on about depositing mandates by looking at what happens in other institutions with mandates such as the one in the Université de Liège in Belgium, they have a really interesting mandate which, in which, amusingly, <coughs> they, they, they don't force people to deposit, but they want people that they will be uh, evaluated only in terms of what is deposited. So, you know, if, you want, if you want your promotion or you want some support from the university, you'd better deposit. 
the, um, the deposit mandates, such as the first big one by NIH in 2008, well, there was the first one before that, but from the welcome, um, these, these mandates are under attack should follow how they are being, they are evolving, but you have there a good way to follow how publishers are trying to regain some element of control over the situation. Look at how people want to or do not want to uh, imitate the United Kingdom. For example, recently in the European Union, uh, there was a, the launch of a project called Open Air 2020, which incorporated a, what they called a gold pilot, which was really 4 million euros to pay for article processing charges for authors who were mandated to put the article in open access and were, uh, were part of the FP7 uh, framework program, um, funding program in seven of the European Union. The, the way the, the, the pro program which is being managed by the Association of Libraries in Europe called Liber was to include the hybrid journals. And it took a lot of pushback from a few people to manage, finally, to get the hybrid journals out of the picture with great anger on the side of some British members of Liber because they thought that this is done in Britain, why should it not be done on the scale of Europe? Don't follow the European UK model, it's a flawed model, it's a crazy model, it's an expensive model. At the national, so at the national level, avoid, for example, hybrid journals and beware of APCs anyway. At the international level, UNESCO is getting involved and is pushing for fairer access to the literature, in particular from third world countries, peripheral countries, and of course, with open access, you can have the beginning of a world system of science which would allow for several centers of interest to develop. Science is universal in the results it produces, but it is not universal in the questions it needs to attack. There are problems that are far more important in one area of the world than in another area of the world. And the way science is organized nowadays is such that some problems are completely Abandoned. Think of Ebola, for example. The Ebola virus, which is extremely dangerous, as you know, was known and has been known for 40 years. And yet, for 40 years, we did damn little to try and see how we could control epidemics, uh, get vaccines, get fuel. You know, instead, because that probably was far more important for the countries that develop scientific research. Viagra was developed. No, put Viagra in the in the, Ebola, in, the in the in the scale and tell me which one is the more important. Okay. And what about the future? And I'll stop with that for uh, questions if you have any, and I hope you do. Well, I think the main thing, and that that's what we're doing this morning, since you are all of us will be future researchers, I suppose, as doctoral students, um, you must educate yourself about that situation. Read about it, inform yourself, understand what's at stake, understand what's best for you as a researcher, and be careful about a lot of the stuff you'll read there. That's a very good field where to exercise and test your critical mind. Uh, get involved, as many of us did back in 2001. I'm mean, thinking of people like Stefan Hartmann, Michael Eisen. I was there I, myself. Uh, this is what you have to do also. Get involved in your institutions. Push for open access. Do what you can for open access. It's only a win-win for you. Try to help governments understand the implications of the present publishing setup. For example, if governments, as too often they do, try to evaluate for research grants or promotions, uh, people according to where they publish, the same government should not be surprised if they have to pay so much for the journals. If you help bolster, reinforce, create, and, and make visible an inelastic market, only blame yourself if some people are greedy enough to take advantage of your stupidity. 
Now, we as researchers have things to tell the government about that. This is stupid. Okay? And finally, the evaluation of research is absolutely central in that battle. So you have to go to a system of evaluation where you are evaluated by the content of your articles, not the place where you publish. This means nothing at all. Remember that the mathematician who finally solved the Poincaré conjecture a couple of years ago, a Russian, published that on the web. He didn't even publish it in the journal. And he got the Fields Medal. The big problem for some mathematician was, can we give him the Fields Medal for having solved a problem no one had been able to solve for over a century, given that he has not published in the peer-reviewed journal? And the result was, the response was, of course, well, is his, is his answer good or not good? All mathematicians say it's good. What more, what more peer reviewing do you want to have? Can anybody refute what he said? No? Well, then shut up. You know? So if you start thinking about the quality of the work rather than the fact that you have to be published by the American Mathematical Society or some such association, I think you'll be on the right track to bring back quality at the center rather than journal titles which are acting very much like Armani uh, suits, you know. It's a logo, it's a branding device. I'm not sure Armani suits are that much better than other suits. But apparently, some people feel better and grander when they can show that they have the money to pay for an Armani suit. Okay? Not that I'm paying in Italy for Armani suits, obviously. But then you can see where I'm going. So, in, in the sort of conclusion, the battle is philosophical, so think about it and reflect on it. Political, very much so. The publishers are lobbying governments like crazy. There are more than 20 Elsevier lobbyists on the Hill in Washington, and probably about as many in Brussels. And of course, it's economical. The economics of the thing have to be taken into account. The integrity of the research process is at stake. Why? Because many of the journals in science have their title being the property of the publisher, not the editorial board, but the publisher. And if the publisher thinks the editorial board is not doing enough, not for the quality of the journal, but for, let's say, the commercial success of the journal, then, then they, and stories have existed to demonstrate that, then they have replaced people in the editorial board. Now the editorial board are the people who ultimately select articles to be published. So in effect, Elsevier is choosing people to select articles in the journal. In effect, Elsevier becomes an integral part of the orientation of where science should be going. Is that the way it should be? I don't think so. I really don't think so. And when I hear publishers saying that, oh, you can't leave the publishing of science in the hands of government because they might interfere with uh, what's happening in the publication tool, I'm laughing myself very loudly because I say, don't you, aren't you doing that yourself right now? Okay? So that's another issue that's at stake in that. And finally, I think the, the solution is, the situation is actually quite simple. International publishers want to control the communication channels of science. Because, first of all, that's the way to ensure the revenue streams. But ultimately, they could become the deciders on the world scale of where science should be going and not going, and what they should be developing and not really developing, by, by creating the hot topics, the, the, uh, the convergence of, of interest around this particular uh, question or another, and I don't think that is that is entirely good for science. When a publisher has enough money to notice that there is some nascent interest in a particular interdisciplinary field that doesn't have a journal yet, and they create that journal, and they choose people to be part of the editorial board, they are essentially promoting some of the researchers into a power position inside the journal, which uh, is entirely under the control, ultimately, of that publisher. Now, the situation is more complex than I present it here, because, of course, you have to maintain the legitimacy of science by keeping a facade of objectivity and autonomy. 
But deep down, behind all of that autonomy facade, think of what a publisher can do to the orientation of a journal. Presently, economically, the publishers have the upper hand. They have very deep pockets. But when you make 40% profit on the revenue, uh, and that's a lot of money. Elsevier makes about a billion dollars of profit every year. Uh, so they can influence governments. They have a strong coordinating body which allows the publishers to sort of organize strategies together. It's the STM association. And the situation is sufficiently complex that most researchers are quite confused. And let me tell you, publishers do everything they can to keep the landscape as confusing as possible. So it's part of your work as a researcher cut through the fog, understand the real issues, and locate yourself where you think it's right. Follow your principles, your values, and your self-interest. I think you'll do well. So, you should educate yourself. You should try and use OA uh, as much as possible, and push for it as possible. But be careful at your age and at the stage in which you are. Don't put your own career in jeopardy as long as the evaluation systems are as crazy as they are right now, namely based on the impact factor or similar solutions. Molto grazie. Now the floor is yours. I'll answer to any question you may have. But please don't speak all together. It's been done correctly, 
from a scientific point of view. So you see, you get you get these kinds of new approaches to quality control, which ultimately may change quite a bit uh, in the way science uh, things that we happen in the way science is done. And that that, by the way, is very important um, in the situation of third world countries, for example. Why? Because in a, in, imagine you work in a third world country where the resources are very rare, difficult, and so on. And there are questions of great interest locally for scientific work. I mentioned Ebola for Africa a while ago. Um, if you are a, a relatively good scientist in Africa or in Latin America or Southeast Asia, there's a good chance, first of all, that you have been trained outside your country. So you're already caught in the line of questioning, which is not directed by the needs or, or preoccupations of the region you come from. You may have to apply for money to international bodies, which tend to be directed by the kinds of questions which, again, are of interest to what I will call rapidly the OECD countries, the rich countries. So that you end up with a paradox where the person who is working in science with some success in a third world country may well end up having to deal with problems which are of little interest to his or her country and um, resolving problems that are of great interest to rich countries so that it's a way of, you know, of appropriating the great power of some of the best people in the third world for the advantage of the rich countries. So open access again by, for example, separating, allowing to think about separating quality of work from relevance to X, X kind of preoccupation, allows perhaps for a redistribution of the way in which problems are raised in science, allowing for poorer countries to have a voice in the choice of problems to pursue. Other questions? <coughs> well, I'm probably a bit so obscure that you haven't understood the thing. <laughs> I can't have been so clear that you have understood everything. <laughs> Am I to understand that you're a bunch of shy people? You know the student, but they look well. Maybe a question about uh, uh, how to organize uh, the uh, process uh, to facilitate uh, uh, open access within uh, institutions. Uh, for instance, in, in particular, in Italy, I see a certain degree of uh, paternalism in, in, the, in the way in which. Uh, Universities uh, and libraries are trying to avoid any kind of legal risk for their uh, researcher and professor because, of course, uh, 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 in this uh, hopefully tra uh, transition period, I don't know who is the word open access or what. Uh, anyway, if we, if we have to move to uh, uh, an open access uh, approach, uh, individual researchers have to deal with copyright issues to uh, negotiate the uh, addenda uh, to, to the standard uh, corporate contracts with the uh, uh, publisher in certain cases, uh, or in any, any, any way they have to understand uh, the legal status of their works in order to decide whether or not they can be uploaded to open access uh, uh, repositories and so on. So I can say this for my colleagues on this side. Uh, yeah, but but no, first point. The open access movement has never advocated to go against the copyright law. Never. So take that as a base. I'm not advocating for you to do piracy or this kind of thing. I think the best answer, the simplest answer for an institution, like say the Polytechnico, is not only to have a depository, which it does, I believe, but have a dark archive. And by default, people just deposit in the dark archive with a request button and let the librarians then see what can be exposed, uh, you know, uh, that way. That way there is absolutely no problem for the researcher. It's simple. I deposit in the dark archives. 
And I know that even if it's in the dark archive, I know it can still be useful as open access because there will be a request for it. And anyone who is interested by my article looking at the summary of the, the title and the authors uh, will just have to click on the thing, they'll get the article within probably a day, if not, uh, if not sooner, as soon as the author realizes that there has been a request for such a thing. So that completely cuts out the problem of can I deposit that? Do I go to the Romeo Sherpa list to find out whether this publisher still accepts that, but suddenly the publisher changes the rules and everything is out of, of kilter and all that? Just put it in the dark shelter. For the European project OpenAI, and there's silly uh, go pilot, some people, because of the academic freedom uh, issue, were saying, well, if you don't want the hybrid journals, you're going to limit the publication of the, the possibilities of publishing for the for the European researchers. And my answer was not at all. That there is a, a what they call an orphan repository over there, which is called Zenodo, which is at, at CERN in uh, Geneva. And I said, just add a dark archive in Zenodo, and then let the librarians of the corresponding to the authors. Uh, send a note to Zenodo saying we guarantee that this can be exposed in this way and so on so forth. Yeah, this is uh, where we're shifting the, the legal risk on the institution, I mean, really. It's, uh, the, 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 the librarians are taking the, the decision and therefore if uh, the publisher wants to sue somebody, it will be the polytechnic and not the author, which is good for the author. Maybe not. But the risk is minimal. You know, the, the, the risk for the librarian is this, this is the publisher, that's his uh, policy right now, at such and such a date. Normally, a policy doesn't act retroactively. So I put it according to the policy. And, uh, you know, that's why, that's why publishers are very worried about the dark archive in the public, very well. You see? No, I see, I see the point. I also see that. Uh, no institution in Italy is uh, brave enough to take even if it's a very small risk. Maybe because they are not uh, putting enough resources but then, on, on the library, because you need to have the librarian prepared to take the decision and you, you have to give them okay. this. Let me ask you a question. When you drive your car, how many times do you cross over a continuous line on the road? And if there is a car behind you, what happens? So you take a risk. So if you're capable of taking that into risk, uh, going over the continuous slide of the road, I mean, I don't see why you could take that very minuscule risk in the, in the library. People are not that, that uh, timid, are they? Well, the polytechnic discourages us from driving cars. <laughs> so... <laughs> okay, bad example. <laughs> but you, you get my point. Yes, yes. I mean, really, it's all about this doesn't even require courage, it just requires a bit of method, you see. It, the risk of talking about is someone reading the wrong line in the, in the table and thinking that that article will have followed the answer of your policy and not the other way to other company of policy. But that's, you know, and even that would not be a big risk in court. First of all, if you get a system, this system better, and they, they just take the thing according and carry it. Any more questions? Is open access boring? Well, I guess then, uh, thank you very much for your. Uh,